Good morning and welcome to the service with the difference. It is the 19th of June 2022. It is our second Sunday after Pentecost um, and really our first Sunday in our journey through the ordinary season, our season of growth. And for the next few weeks, we are going to be looking at Paul's letter to the people of Galatia as he tries to clear up some confusion that they have about law and grace. Um, we, we are reading from Psalm 32 today, just the psalm where the psalmist says, Blessed are those who, whose sins have been forgiven, those who have come to, to God, who have received God's mercy and who, who walk in fellowship with God. Now we're going to be reading from Genesis chapter 17. We are reading um, from the third covenant conversation that God has with Abraham. Um, and from this conversation, it leads into the conversation about circumcision. Um, then we're going to be reading from John chapter 1. We're going to read from verse 10 to verse 18. The word has become flesh and the word became flesh to make God known to, to man. Then we're going to read from Galatians. We're going to read from chapter 3, from verse 23 through to verse 29. Better to read, though, from chapter 3, verse 15, all the way to chapter 4, verse 7, just to give us a fuller picture of what Paul is speaking about as he compares law and, and grace. Again, I'm going to ask that you put this on pause as you read through those readings. And as we read through them, we give God thanks for them. And we pray that he will bless them to us as we reflect on them in, in this moment. As Paul speaks to the people of Galatia about the law, we, we, we really get the sense that he, he, is, he is saying the law and grace are not, not enemies. They, they are friends. They work with each other together. And I guess we could understand the law as given by God to Moses would, would kind of be like the person who, who drives a child to school, um, whether it's a bus driver or a taxi driver or um, somebody who's just using their car to take all of the children in the neighborhood to, to school. You know, the person who, who drives them doesn't, doesn't replace the parent, although they, they fulfill the role of the parent while, while the children are in their vehicle in, in loco parentis, that law is. You know, they do everything that they can to, to take the child to, to school um, safely. And, and they're able to point out all the dangers that are in the community, in the neighborhood, as they drive to school. And obviously, they, they protect them from those dangers by virtue of the fact that they are within the confines of, of the vehicle that they're going to school in. They're not, they're not walking through the danger that is present in the community. Sometimes these drivers also have to tie shoelaces. They, they've got to rebuke the children when the children are misbehaving in the vehicle. Um, and even though they sometimes depending on the, on the driver, even though they sometimes help the children with schoolwork, they, they are not meant to be the teachers. They are just meant to get the children to school safely so that the teacher can mold them and help form them and help them become productive members of society. So the driver prepares the student for, for the teacher. You know, the driver doesn't replace the teacher and, and the teacher doesn't replace the driver, but, but the teacher is the reason for the driver and completes the function of, of the driver. You know, the, the teacher fulfills the work of the driver, fulfills the promise um, that is made before the driver was, was ever acquired. You know, the teacher promised a good education, but since the child is not able to get to the teacher themselves, we needed to work out a way of how we were going to get the child to the teacher, and, and this is where the driver can, comes in. Um, the law is the driver. And, and Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise that the law has always pointed to. And Paul speaks about how this, this understanding, his understanding of the law and of grace changed his heart and, and in fact changed his, his entire world. Um, God has made a promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 17, um, 3 to 8. He says to Abraham, there are going to be children, nations of children coming from you. And they are going to have land, Canaan, the land that, that, that they were standing on. Um, that land would be called Israel eventually. Um, he says, but they're going to have this promised land. And, and God says, and I will be their God and, and they will be my people. They will be the people who worship me. Um, they will be the sign for the whole world of, of who I am. And the law that God gives to Moses about 400, 430 years after this promise he has made to, to Abraham, this law doesn't replace the promise made by God to Abraham. Um, and the fulfillment of the promise also obviously doesn't, doesn't replace the law. The law would always, always be there. And so Paul says the law is given 
to the immature of, of faith, to those who want to believe but haven't yet received God for, for themselves. Um, in the case of the Jews in Sinai and, and for us as believers, um, as Paul writes to believers in Jesus, to the law is given to those who, who haven't received Jesus for themselves. Um, and, and they haven't received God in the case of the Jews and, and, and in the case of the believers, they haven't received Jesus. Because they're not sure that they can trust him yet. Um, they, they have an immature faith. And an immature faith is, is made up of awe because God is awesome and dread. Um, because they're afraid to get things wrong because they're afraid of, of punishment. And so they do what they do in order to avoid punishment. Abraham, as the one who has received this promise of God, has a mature faith. He shows that he's got a mature faith because he has received God for his own. He has spoken with God. He, he knows God. He, he has believed God. He has followed where, where God has led him. And a mature faith is made up of awe and love. Awe because God is still awesome, um, but love because Abraham, for example, he, he, followed, he followed the law without even knowing that there was a law. The law hadn't been written yet. He follows the law out of love for God. Um, he has the law of God written written on his heart. And so the law the law points us to Christ. The law leads us to Christ. The Lord the law takes us to Christ in the same way that that a, a driver will will take a child to school. Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise and the promise is received by those who are convinced of their guilt and the inability of the law to, to save them. Um, they mature enough in their faith to know that they've, they've got no choice but to rely on Christ for their righteousness. Christ, Christ is the one who takes us on to mature faith, where, where we do what we do out of love for Jesus, not, not because we're afraid of, of being punished. Faith in the completed work of Christ is what takes that law that is written on a tablet or on a piece of paper in, in our case, because it's in the Bible, faith in the completed work of Christ is what takes that law and, and writes it on our heart. Because so often, you know, we claim allegiance to Christ, but we leave the law on the paper. We don't allow the Holy Spirit to, to write it into our hearts. And I want to say that's the difference between knowing the story of Christ and allowing the story of Christ to, to change our lives. And Christ will change everyone's heart. Christ changes our hearts, our lives change when we experience our baptism into Christ. Um, water baptism speaks of our baptism into the church, the church universal. And it's a symbol of what will take place when we are baptized in, in the Holy Spirit, when we are convicted that we are loved by God, the moment of our, our conversion, our baptism into the Spirit. And, and the reason our lives are changed is because although we may always know that we are children of God by virtue of, of being born, um, it is in this moment that we know that we are children of God because the Holy Spirit has convicted us that we are loved by a God who is holy. We are loved deeply by a God who wants to make us holy as, as he is holy. And it's in this baptism that we, we understand that we are unworthy. But it is here that we recognize that we are just as unworthy as everybody else. You know, there's an equality in our failure to make peace with God. And it's in this baptism that we are reborn into eternity. You know, like the angels, there is no distinction between one or the other. There is an equal footing before God at the cross. The church is made up of Jews and Greeks, says, says Paul to the people of Galatia. The church is made up of Jews and Greeks, free and slave, male and female. No one is better than anyone else. No one is more worthy of one gift or service than anyone else. In Christ, there is no distinction. And as believers, we, we can never allow a distinction to exist. And so when we embrace who we are in, in Christ, says Paul, it's not just our lives that are changed, but it's, it's our entire world that is changed. And I'm not sure that Paul's concern was, was to change the world. For, for Paul, it was about changing the people of God. If the community has changed, then it doesn't matter what the world says, because the community will be a space of equality and a space of justice and a space in which all people are free to, to be who, who God has called them to be. And so Paul understood that his work was to help God's people become the community they would be in, in the presence of God. He believed that the community could be heaven on earth, a realized kingdom of God. It wasn't a nice to belong to kind of community. It wasn't a club. It, it wasn't a community in which the believer was able to, to live and hang on to the values that they held in the world. 
it was a community that challenged everything we believed about ourselves, everything we knew about ourselves, as we struggled to let go of the values we held on to in the world and, and embrace the, the values that God offers us in, in the kingdom or the, the values that God calls us to, to share in his kingdom. And Paul understood that this was going to be a challenging community because we would be gathered together with people we, we didn't choose, but with people who chose Christ and are being renewed as much as we are being renewed. Um, and so all of a sudden we're kind of forced to live with those who are on the journey of becoming like Christ um, as we are on the journey of becoming like Christ. None of us are yet like Christ. And so all of a sudden we're surrounded by people who eat with utensils. We're surrounded by people who eat without utensils. We're surrounded by people who don't love BLT sandwiches. We're surrounded by people who do like BLT sandwiches. We're, we're surrounded by people who, who want to agree with us or who want to disagree with us um, based on the color of our skin or based on our wealth or our lack of wealth or based on our gender or based on our, our age. And, and we have an ugly habit as humanity of deciding for the Holy Spirit who the Holy Spirit can work in. And Paul reminds the believers that regardless of what we face on earth because of our race or our gender or our age, in Christ we, we are free to live as those who have the law of God written, written on our hearts. And as we become a part of this community that, that will allow us to go into holiness um, as it goes on to holiness itself, we are individually changed and we are corporately changed and, and that change will affect the world. When the world sees in us a better way of living, when, when they see how the widows and the orphans and the poor and the strangers are taken care of amongst, amongst us, then, then we become a testament of the completed work of Christ. We become a testament to God's promise of being a part of his mission in this world. God's promise of relationship with us supersedes anything else in our life. It is, it is before the law, and, and it is the reason for grace. And, and God wants to be in communion with us, and he wants us to enjoy fellowship with him. That's, that's what grace is. That's God's gift to us. And the law itself is a part of God's grace. You know, when we, when we don't know who, who we are meant to be as a child of God, when, when our hearts are hard, and when there is something blocking our way to, to fellowship with God, the law convicts us of our sin. And when we are convicted of our sin, we're, we're able to repent. And when we're able to repent, we're able to receive God's gift of life. And so the Holy Spirit does this work when we allow the Holy Spirit to write God's, God's law in our hearts. And God's gift of life is, is that gift that will, that will help us repent. It, it helps us get up. It helps us move on as we, we carry on moving towards holiness. And so the question, I guess, for, for each of us and that each of us need to answer in this moment is where are we in our faith? Do you want to remain in the driver's vehicle? Do you want to remain subject to the law? Or do you want to go to the teacher? Do you want to sit at the teacher's feet and, and become a productive member of God's kingdom as you dwell in his grace? Where do you want to be? Let's pray. Lord God, even, even when we get confused, even when we're unsure of your word, even when we're unsure of your intentions, we, we're reminded in this moment, Lord God, that you are acutely aware of how we think, of how we feel, of, of how we respond even. And so your law is exactly what we need to get us to that point of receiving your grace. Lord, give us the courage to step deeper into faith. Help us trust you. Help us follow where you lead, all the while helping us discern between the word of your Holy Spirit and the selfish desires of our own hearts. Help us, Lord, to sit at the feet of you, our teacher. Help us become a productive member of your kingdom so that your kingdom can be on earth as it is in heaven. Hear us, Lord, as we pray this in your precious name. Amen.